The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. This is Orioles preview. Orioles going for six in a row tonight as they take on the Atlanta Braves and coverage here on ESPN 630. We'll start at six o'clock. We do Orioles preview every Wednesday. TJ Brightman, who is the chief revenue officer for the team, joins us now. And sometimes we have guests here and we don't exactly know what they do based on their title. I would say, TJ, when you introduce yourself as chief revenue officer, people know you're the money guy, right? (laughs) Yeah, I, I guess so, Andy. Uh, good morning to you. How, how are you? How are you doing today? I, I'm how good. And, and I was checking on your background. We have some similarities. Didn't you have a, a long run in radio before you uh, got to the Orioles? I did, actually. Yeah, I worked uh, I worked uh, in radio for about 13 years uh, on air and then also on the sales side. And I guess that's where I uh, I kind of got bit by the sales bug and, and have uh, been putting together, um, you know, deals like this uh, for, for quite some time. And, and uh, we're super excited in Birdland uh, about some of the things that we just announced uh, yesterday that I think we're going to get into and talk about. Yeah, we will. And, and I would say that you did the smart thing getting off the air because there's no money in that. And then going to sales in radio, which is a, a shrinking, uh, shrinking proposition right now. So, so you've made the right career yes. move. And I'm sure your mom is real happy with that, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. She wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? Oh, of course. And, uh, yeah. So I had to, be a, had to be a radio guy and a baseball executive. Yeah, I know. I, I shame the family in the same way. I, I, I get that. Um, uh, TJ is on actually uh, to talk about a partnership, uh, which is, uh, and I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, was was rolled out last night um, as they have made an, an agreement with T. Rowe Price, which includes putting a uniform uh, patch on the sleeve, which a number of teams are doing. Uh, give us the, the rundown on how that came together and what's going to be involved in the partnership. Yeah, great. Well, we, we did make the announcement last night uh, when we started our series against the Braves. And um, this is something we've been working on for a little less than two years, uh, shortly after the, the new CBA um, came out and was agreed to. Uh, all 30 clubs had the opportunity to do uh, patch partnerships. And um, we were pretty strategic. I think the, the, the Padres were one of the first clubs to do, um, do their partnership with Motorola. But we kind of sat back and we wanted to watch um, and sort of observe and see what see how this this new sort of asset was uh, was going to be um, you know sort of uh, delivered and we wanted to we wanted to kind of do it the right way. I think one of our number one number one goals was to find a company that had Baltimore ties. Um, if if a company was going to put their name or their marks on our jerseys, then we really thought it had to have a connection. They had to have a connection in, with Baltimore uh, to be based in Baltimore, headquartered in Baltimore, that would be a bonus. So we, we spent um, a little less than two years talking to a lot of different companies, a lot of national companies, a lot of global companies. And traditionally what happens with these types of partnerships, Andy, is you usually have a company that is looking to make a splash um, in a particular market and obviously playing in the AL East. Um, you know, it's super competitive and, mm. and maybe arguably the best division in baseball. Uh, I guess we're biased, but we still believe that you get a lot of eyeballs when you have a patch partnership. So um, we were really fortunate that T Rowe stepped up, and and uh, obviously they're headquartered in Baltimore and have been have been for about 88 years, and uh, it's it's going to be a, it's just going to be a really great partnership uh, with them for many years. You uh, you answered the next question when you said this has been in the works for two years. Uh, when I heard this, I, I would assume, I had assumed, obviously incorrectly, that this came in with David Rubenstein, who is a, a great investor. Uh, this has obviously been in, in the works before we bought the team, huh? Yeah, before David and, and Michael Arigetti bought the team, we had been sort of well on our way um, having these discussions, um, you know, not specifically with, with T. Rowe for that amount of time, but just in general. Right. Um, the fact that they're in the private equity business, they were certainly familiar with T. Rowe Price. In fact, David, over the last two days or so, even yesterday, um, day before rather, when we made the announcement on Monday, uh, talked about how um, T. Rowe was instrumental in, um, in his company um, when he first started. And Michael Arigetti said the same thing when he started Aries. So there's, it's, it's really interesting. We call it small um, <laughs> as you're probably familiar. And uh, I'm a Baltimore guy, so yeah. I'm not surprised to hear these, these tie-ins, but it's, uh, it's really special. So we're very, very happy. 
Now, uh, explain the whole revenue picture with baseball. Uh, football has not yet gone to the to patches. They do it in training camp, but they don't do it in the regular season. It's in the NBA. I guess it's in the NHL now. Um, how significant a, a part of, of baseball revenue is a deal like this? Well, you know, all these types of deals, um, these partnerships, obviously fuel the economic engine. And, uh, you know, we get the question, we've gotten the question over the last 24, 48 hours, uh, you know, this tying it back to the players on the field. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's the first thing that the fans yeah. think of. Um, you know, it's it's not going to change our, our direction, uh, the direction that, uh, that David and, and, and Michael Aragetti and, of course, Michael Elias have. Um, that's not my lane. I let them, I let them handle, um, those types of things on the field. My responsibility, as you joked, is to, is to, is to bring in, is to bring in the revenue with my, my teams. Um, but when you do partnerships like this, certainly, uh, marquee level partnerships, they, they really help all, as, uh, all areas of the baseball operation, not just on the field, but off the field, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of money to run a baseball team. You get a lot of employees. And it also allows us to bring in talent, and that's not just talent on the field. So um, that, that those dollars will be used uh, not only inside the warehouse but also in the community, and that's another another piece that we're real excited about too. Talking to T.J. Brightman, Chief Revenue Officer for the Baltimore Orioles. They've just announced the deal with T. Rowe Price. And, uh, well, I mean, can you tell me if I'm in the ballpark of these reported numbers of $75 million, or is that a well-guarded secret? Andy, can you keep a secret? Can your listeners keep <laughs> oh, well, it's only us two talking. Nobody's listening. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to keep a secret. I can keep a secret better. So, yeah, I, 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 I know you probably want the scoop, but, yeah, uh, yeah it's something that we're, we're just going to we're gonna keep between us and, and inside the warehouse and, yeah. and, uh, and T. Rowe Price. And, um, um, you know, again, uh, it's, it's, it's a really good day in Birdland, mm-hmm. uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've, uh, we're going for six in a row tonight. So yeah. that's even better. Winning helps. Um, I, I don't know if this is your area, but things are obviously changing dramatically in the uh, regional broadcast networks and how the games are distributed and so forth. Where do you see this going as, uh, as regional cable networks are struggling now and, uh, and the deal that's in place with Masson and the Nationals? Is that, is that going to be resolved to, be, to the point where everybody's happy and making money, or do you see that changing as, as we go down the line? Well, I think that, and again, this, and you said it, this is not, nece- this is not necessarily my lane, but I will say that um, when David Rubenstein came in, one of the first things that he said, and he said it publicly, was that, um, you know, he wanted to resolve uh, the Nassau issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's certainly important uh, to this ownership group. In terms of, um, you know, sort of the, the, the landscape changing with RSNs, um, I think we're all we're all seeing that right with uh, with cord cutting being what it is. Right. Um, gosh, I looked at uh, I looked at the number of of, uh, of streaming services now that I that I uh, that I subscribe to, and it's it's more than I can <laughs> than I can count on one hand. I think we're all in that place. Um, so it's 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 something that um, I think I know the league is taking a strong look at. Um, you know, we're we fortunate, obviously, that we've had we've had Mass in along with with the Nationals and. Um, and you know, there are obviously other RSNs that are, that are struggling, but I think it's more of a league thing. And I think the league is going to take a, take a hard look and, uh, figure out what's, what's best for baseball, but, but really also what's best for the fans. And that's really what it comes down to. You know, fans should be able to, uh, uh, should be able to, uh, to watch their, yeah. their favorite team or teams. Yeah, well, look, I mean, we don't have Apple TV, and my wife, who grew up in Pikesville, is, is always grumbling when the games are on, on Apple. And so, yeah, I mean, we do have to have it so it's it's available to everybody, you know, the the days of just having cable TV and watching every game. I guess that's that ship has sailed, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, you know, I, I think that the, what, what the league will probably take a look at is, I mean, you could you, you might see a day where, um, where clubs take control of those assets and, and uh, you have a situation where uh, fans have an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to watch, watch not only their favorite team, but other teams. So it's an AL East package or it's an American League package. But again, there are people uh, a lot higher pay grade than me that, that make those decisions. So I'm just kind of sitting back and watching and 
Um, right now, we're uh, we're happy the fact that uh, we're battling the Yankees for yep. the AL East pennant and trying to win another one. No question. I mean, it's 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 a great story uh, of rebuilding an organization to a point where it's uh, it's <laughs> unfortunately you're the second best team in the American League and you're in second place. But that's you know that's that kind of goes with the territory of battling the Yankees when they're good. So you know that's how that works. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. Um, the the last money question I would ask you that the state is pumping, as I understand, six hundred million dollars into Camden Yard. What what will fans see? And I don't know if that's that started yet or not. But when that money is is pumped into the stadium, what kind of changes are they going to see at Camden Yards? So there will be a lot of uh, you know uh, front of house uh, type things that that fans will see. You know we're in the process of of going through those those initiatives right now. Um, obviously that's all controlled by the state um, in terms of procurement of contracts and such. And, and that's because obviously it's, it's, it's state funding. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're, we're, we're really anticipating, um, you know, everything from, uh, from video boards to um, new audio video and, and things that the fans can benefit from in addition to new spaces. Uh, you know, when Cannon Yards opened uh, 31 years ago, Baseball fans uh, traditionally would buy a full season plan and they would sit in the same place and they, mm-hmm. they, would, they would have season tickets for 20, 25 years. Millennials and uh, Gen Z, they like to come to baseball games and move around. There needs to be more social spaces. So as, as fantastic as Oriole Park is and still is, and we'd love to say, and it's true, that it's the ballpark that forever changed baseball, um, you know, we need to um, we need to create more new amenities for fans. We need to create more areas that uh, fans will enjoy um, even more than they do now, and uh, you know, drive more people downtown, bring more people out to Orioles games. And um, you know, I know the Ravens are doing the same thing because we obviously uh, we're both um, fortunate enough to be the benefactors of of what the state um, awarded uh, both teams uh, approximately one point two billion dollars. So um, it's going to be exciting for for you know both complexes, you know right uh, right there at the Camden Yards complex itself. I, I say this as all all the time as someone who's old enough to be a parent of millennials that uh, <laughs> that the ballpark is amazing and that it's actually 32 years old. It was open 92. Uh, in right. that in that when it opened, it was an old style park, and yet 32 years later, we look at it and say this is great. We don't we don't I don't I I love going there. I don't think it needs to be. You know, normally at this stage of the game and the way pro sports works, oh, stadium's 20 years old, has to go. Like having the Braves cycle through like three stadiums in the time you guys have been in Camden Yards. So it, it, it's amazing that it opened as an old-time ballpark and 32 years later it's still a great place to go and still kind of state-of-the-art in, in baseball, don't you think? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I pinch myself every day that I have the, first of all, the opportunity to work for my hometown baseball team, but then – to uh, sit inside the warehouse and look out at that beautiful ballpark. And you're correct. I mean, that was a ballpark that when it was designed back in 92, it was a throwback park to Ebbets Field or the Polo Grounds, and it still looks great. Uh, I mean, we have we have a great uh, ballpark operations crew. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a great grounds, uh, groundskeeper in Nicole. Um, and it is um, – it's, it's truly – um, just a gem and, uh, you know, fans that come in, we're going to have probably a, a handful of Phillies fans that are going to be there this weekend. More than a handful. And, um, no, you'll, you'll have a lot yeah, of Philly I was, fans. Know, I was kind of, I was kind of, yeah. you know, I was kind of, I was kind of selling it down a little bit, but yeah. yeah. And, and the reason is, is because people enjoy coming to our ballpark. So we're happy about that because obviously more people that come, whether they're from Baltimore or they're from Philly or, or New York or Boston, obviously, uh, you know, we'll t- we always joke, we'll take their money. And yeah. um, it, it, it's great for the economic impact of the city. And um, that's our that's our job, too. So um, it should be actually a really great weekend. We're, we're expecting sellout crowds. Uh, I was looking at the numbers this morning. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, Friday is pretty much close to a sellout, and um, it's going to be a fun, fun, fun weekend. Yeah, in Stan Caston's days here uh, with the Nationals, they well, he once went on Philadelphia radio to beg their fans to come to Washington for opening day. That's how <laughs> tough it was. But I think that I think it was the RFK days. They're in a much better stadium now, so uh, all yeah, is good. I, I oh, hey, great to talk to you. Uh, continued success, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks so much. 
Thanks, Andy. Appreciate the time. Take care. That's T.J. Brightman, Chief Revenue Officer for the Orioles, making that deal with T. Rowe Price. Uh, saw the patches last night. If you watch tonight, I'm sure uh, you'll notice them. Uh, coming up, we'll get to some uh, recap of what happened last night as they got the shutout and uh, where things stand with a very happy ball club. It's the Orioles preview on the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We're wrapping up Orioles preview. Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock. Orioles, man, (laughs) they just keep winning. Problem for them is the Yankees keep winning. And they have won five straight, but really haven't made up any ground. They're still two and a half games back. They have the second best record in the American League, the third best record in baseball. And uh, there's there's something that you might be looking at uh, coming up next week. Because after they get finished with the Phillies this weekend, they go play three games at New York. And if you remember from last year, it looked like Tampa was going to run away with the division. And the Orioles, about this time, it was in June of last year, they won two out of three or three out of four against Tampa. And uh, things changed, and they wound up winning the division. So we'll see. But, you know, you got you got Judge and Soto who are – kind of the modern day Ruth and Gehrig but uh, they did win last night and they did it with a pitcher who was unknown at the beginning of the season Uh, Albert Suarez spent the last five years pitching in Japan and some injuries so they bring him up and he's been terrific as he was again last night he went five and a third gave up four hits Uh, he walked only three struck out four and uh, help to uh, help to lead them to a shutout win. He's three and zero. His ERA is one point six one. This is his manager Brandon Hyde on what he saw from him last night. It's what he's done almost every time since he's, if not every time, he's taken the ball. Um, just a professional effort. Incredible job of. I thought he didn't have his best command tonight, honestly, with his fastball. I thought a lot of fastballs were yanked, but he had a good changeup tonight, and the cutter keeps him off balance and. He's got enough life to his fastball to to mix well. Yeah, and this is more from Hyde on the on the makeup of this guy, journeyman guy, been through everything, including five years in Japan, and uh, and how he comports himself on the mound. I think steady is a great word for him. Um, he just doesn't seem like the heart rate. The heart rate doesn't uh, vary very much. I think he's always under in, in control. He uh, it's never too up. He's never too down. He's just. Um, you know, he pitches like a veteran pitcher where he's not afraid of the moment or, or gets nervous. Um, he's just all about executing his pitches, and he's done an unbelievable job. Particularly conservative with his pitch count limit or pitch count in innings because of the, the flexibility you need from him going forward. I don't know if I can afford it, honestly. I think we need innings. So, um, I'm not... Uh, it's something down the road maybe we'll talk about, but um, and we need innings out of rotation, so not really, not right now. Well, I mean, he only went five and a third last night in a shutout game, but uh, I guess, you know, it's that, that thing they do in baseball. No, he's gone through the order twice. Can't go through the order three times. So uh, that was uh, Suarez from Hyde's perspective. This was uh, Suarez on his outing last night. Attacking the strike zone. And mixing the pitches. Uh, I mean, they have a good offense, and you know we have to be careful and not leave it on the sweet spot for them. So I think that helped me today to to get good results. You obviously have a couple of secondary pitches, but you use that fastball cutter so much of the time. How are you able to use those two pitches in particular to set up at bats and really put yourself in a position for strikeouts? For me, the main thing is uh, establish the fastball. Uh, and then once they're thinking about fastball, I can go to off pitch and then and go back and forth and just, like, keep missing. Back to Brandon Hyde, uh, who made this move. And, and whenever you look at the Cal Ripken record, it, it, look at what happened last night. Gunnar Henderson has been great. He had missed only one start at shortstop all year. The game before, he led off the game with a home run. Seventh time this year he's led off a game with a home run. They gave him a scheduled day off in June. Cal Ripken went years, never had a day off. So that record is as safe as safe can be. But great move in putting Jorge Mateo into that spot. Mateo hits a three-run shot in the 4 nothing win. Here's Hyde. Yeah, he just got a handful of bats yesterday in, in uh, Sarasota and then... Comes out tonight and and gets a 
it's a breaking ball against one of the best left-handed pitchers in the game, if not one of the best pitchers in the game. And um, he he's provided a spark for us all year in everything he's done. Uh, he's hit, he's handled left-handed pitching incredibly well this year and last, and um, taken better at bats against right-handed pitching this year. But the speed, the defense, he's. He's played really well this year. you got to find another place to play him because uh, Gunnar Henderson, rookie of the year, and playing shortstop all the time now. They shifted him back and forth between third and short. He's now the shortstop, but uh, Mateo got the start uh, yesterday and obviously delivered and also delivering off the uh, injured list. or I don't know if he's on the injured list, but had been injured. Austin Hayes, who had uh, three hits last night, three for four in the win, and talked to the postgame crew on Masson. To have four days without starting and to come back with your timing this well tonight, how do you do that when you have that much of a layoff? You got a good coaching staff that helps you get right. You just prepare your body. The training staff got the ribs going uh, after taking that fastball off the ribs in Toronto. So uh, the body was feeling good and the swing was feeling good and had a solid approach tonight. Well, you had a chance to uh, watch Albert Suarez twirl some magic. What are, I mean, I'll, made some clutch pitches tonight. Yeah, he's a great pitcher. He's got really good stuff. Uh, he's got a really good feel for uh, mixing his stuff at the right times, and he pounds his own. He gets chased when he needs chase. Uh, it's a lot of fun to play defense behind him. Austin, most of us uh, mere mortals will never hit a baseball 110 miles an hour as you did on that RBI single in the sixth inning. Can you give us a sense of what that feels like? <laughs> it feels good. Anytime you hit the ball in the barrel on a line, it feels good. That's that's kind of the approach of the plate. You want to hit it hard on a line, so it feels really good. Well, you did it up in Toronto. You know, you, you hit a home run to right center. It's been a little bit of a, you know, as far as driving the ball that way. Then you got a breaking ball. You hit another home run and all that. What was it like to prepare for a left-hander like Max Fried? He's one of the better left-handers in baseball. He's got a lot of good pitches. Uh, he mixes speeds. He mixes both sides of the plate. Uh, so you got to be stubborn to staying in the zone. Um, you just got to have a solid plan. You can't hit all of them. So. Well, good to see you stubborn tonight. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Austin Hayes. And by the way, before we let you go, you were in left field tonight, so you were near the pasture. Uh, you have a cow cameraman right now, and Neil shooting you. Did you uh, enjoy the pasture out in left field, the Colton Kowser fan section? We won tonight. We're 1-0 and with the pasture at home, so I guess we'll have to keep it rolling. There you go. That's the final word from the man himself. Thank you, Austin. That's Thanks, it. guys. Austin Hayes on the, on the post game, and that's an indication of when you have a really good team, when they have all this fun stuff. Five years ago, the baby shark. Now you have Colton Kowser, the cow pasture. You also have the zone where you get sprayed where they splash uh, zone splash zone there you go so yeah you have all that stuff and that's that goes along with all the good times so maybe this is the year for the orioles uh, that wraps things up want to thank mike callow for uh, running the show thanks to tj brightman chief revenue officer of the orioles for joining us tony is next i'll see you back here tomorrow at 9 a.m